Hello everyone. In the previous lecture, I discussed the detectors for gamma, gamma ray counting based on scintillation detectors and uh, mainly the sodium iodide thallium detector which we discussed in details. Also some of the more advancements in the scintillation detector technology. Today I will discuss one of the most advanced detector systems for gamma spectrometry that is based on semiconductor detectors. So as you know the semiconductors are materials which have the band gap in the range of around few electron volts. They are between metals and insulators and these detectors were developed in the in 1960s and are mainly based on the two semiconductor materials like silicon and germanium. They have a lot of advantages over the detectors that we have discussed so far. Namely, they have the excellent energy resolution. They have the fast timings. Of course, the efficiency for detection for gamma ray is not that high because of the low atomic number of these materials like silicon is 14, germanium is 32. But the overall, the detectors are one of the best detectors for the spectroscopy of gamma rays. The basic principle of the detectors is similar to the gas filled counters like analgesin chambers. In the analgesin chambers, the incom incoming radiation ionizes the gas medium, creating electron the positive ions and electrons. Whereas in the case of semiconductors, the radiation when it falls on the detector material generates electron hole pairs. So electron hole pairs are analogous to the positive ion and electron ion pair in a gas detector. So the basically the semiconductor detectors function upon collection of electrons and holes at the respective electrodes. So this is a schematic of the semiconductor material. We have the valence band and we have the conduction band. In a semiconductor, the bulk of the, 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 the electrons will be in the valence band, but because of certain temperatures, even at room temperature, you will find there will be a significant quantity of electrons in the conduction band. So that is the, the there are electron hole pairs generated thermally in a semiconductor material, and the probability per unit time that an electron hole pair will be generated depends upon the band gap, this is the band gap and the temperature. So even at room temperature, there will be a sizable number of electron hole pairs in the conduction band and therefore when you want to use the detectors for counting of different types of radiations, we will need to take care of this particular aspect. So the band gaps of this main detector material silicon and germanium are given here. Silicon is 1.115 electron volt, germanium is 0.65 electron volt and the W value as I mentioned earlier also, W values are higher than the band gaps or the ionized potentials in the gaseous media. Again because every interaction may not lead to electron hole pair formation. Many a times these electrons and hole will get trapped and so they, they are not really useful for the collection of the charge. So germanium being higher Z is used mainly for the gamma ray spectroscopy, the gamma ray counting, whereas silicon being the lower Z is used for alpha counting or even the other charged particles like protons and heavy ions. Both these detector materials in fact are being widely used for charged particle spectroscopy or gamma ray spectroscopy, I will discuss mainly the germanium based detectors and little bit touch upon the silicon based ones. Now how, what is the basic principle of these detectors? Any of these semiconductor materials you have, you in fact you cannot have a pure germanium crystal, 100% pure or pure silicon crystal, but there will be by the, by the process of manufacturing, 
they will be always associated with some impurity. So if you have a electron rich impurity doped in these materials like tetravalent materials, silicon and germanium, these pentavalent impurities like phosphorus and uh, antimony, then we call it n-type because over the tetravalent there is a pentavalent so there is an excess electron to these impurity centers and so they are called electron rich centers or n-type semiconductors. On the other hand, if there are electron deficient impurities like boron and aluminum, the trivalent ones with respect to the tetravalent silicon and germanium, then they are electron deficient with respect to the bulk material and we call them as P-type semiconductors. So how do we make use of this P-type or N-type materials for detection of radiation that I try to explain in this next slide. So basically what we need to have is a semiconductor diode. So how do you make a diode? You take a N-type and you take a P-type and join them electronically. So you have what when you say N-type material means it is rich in electrons. When we have P-type material it is rich in holes or electron deficient material. So when you join them then depending upon the type of biasing that you invoke you can have a different scenario. So I try to explain based on what way we bias this diode. So it's a two, two electrode system, N-type and P-type materials are there connected to the anode and cathode of a detector and the, the biasing system. So when you do a forward biasing, when we, what do you mean by forward biasing? That means the electrons are going across the junction to the anode and the holes are going across the junction to cathode. So when we join the N and P type of semiconductor materials and if there is a forward biasing then you will find, find there is a flow of leptons and holes across this junction and there will be a large amount of current generated even without any radiation falling on the detector system. So this is called the forward biasing and this mechanism results in a large amount of leakage current. That means inherently the system, there is a lot of current flowing through the circuit in this system in the forward bias mode. So this forward bias mode is not utilized for using this as a radiation detectors. On the other hand, let us see the reverse biasing mode. In the reverse biasing mode, the n-type semiconductor is connected to the anode. So you have the electrons going towards anode and you have the, the, the neutron deficient side connected to the cathode. So what is happening now when you apply the reverse bias to this diode junction, diode material, you will find that the electrons are going to anode, the holes are going to cathode and so there is a net, no net flow of electrons and holes across the junction. So there is a very very small leakage current. Of course there will be some uh, electrons on the P side which will go towards the, uh, which will cross the junction there will be some holes in the N side which will cross the junction. So there will be a small leakage current anyway. But the bulk leakage current that was flowing in the forward biasing case is not flowing in the reverse biasing. So the detectors, the semiconductor materials, if you want to use them as detectors, we use them in the reverse biasing. So I hope the concept of reverse biasing is clear. By reverse biasing, we decrease the leakage current significantly by connecting the N side to the anode and the P side to the cathode. In fact, it, it was the case earlier when we did not have the semiconductor materials of very high purity. So you have inherently a high concentration of impurities like N type or P type and if you want to make a detector then you have to necessarily compensate for the impurity concentrations by making a diode. But nowadays the technology of semiconductor detectors has become so good that the whatever the pure materials that you have, the concentrations of impurities are of the order of about 10 atoms per cc or even less than that. People are talking about 13 n purity. When you say 13 n purity, 99.99999 and so on, total there will be 13 nines. So that is called 13 n purity. They are highly, highly pure materials. So the impurity concentrations become about 10 atoms per cc or so. So such a detector material like germanium or silicon then there are very very few impurities and this is called as the intrinsic detector material. 
So that means the number of electrons and holes is uh, very, very low. So there will be very, very less leakage current flowing through the, the, the diode junction. Now, to make this as a detector, anyway, you have to need LP junction. So what you do, you create an N-type layer on one side and you create a P-type layer on the other side. So you have a N inherent, this is called the intrinsic detector material. So NIP. So essentially, if you have this uh, reverse bias, you are actually creating an intrinsic region, which is which where there are no excess electrons or holes. And so uh, you, you can take a pure material, relatively pure material, and then if, you, if this is a pure material, then you can you need to create n type and p type layers on both sides. So how do you create an n type layer? Or n type layer, like if you take a germanium crystal, you can take a, you can diffuse the lithium from one side. Lithium will go in the interstitial positions, and you generate the n type. Or you can implant phosphorus or a pentavalent impurity by ion implantation. Similarly, the p type. You can create a surface barrier, like in, you can etch the surface, so there will be an oxide layer, and oxide layer becomes a surface barrier, and then you have a gold coating to protect it, to make it electro, make it electro, electrode contacts. So you can create n-type layer or p-type layer of a few microns on both sides, and the bulk material is intrinsically pure. So there again, the n side you connect to the anode, and p side to the cathode. And now you have that detector system ready for operation. So the germanium detector that are now available with highly pure crystals are called HPGE, high purity germanium detector. This is a particular photograph of a detector. So you have the crystal here, germanium crystal, which is in the vacuum because you, you should not come to room temperature. So germanium detectors, so when you are using them for gamma spectroscopy, to, to further reduce the leakage current, they need to be kept at liquid nitrogen. And so liquid nitrogen, if you are having a cold finger connected to the, the cryostate, then you need to have the detector at vacuum. Otherwise, it will start sweating. And then you have the system for different geometry to keep the samples at different distance. And you have the preamplifier all inside this casing. So you have a field, field FET system, field effective transistors to take care of the shaping of the pulse. So this is the typical a 30 liter DVR containing liquid nitrogen to cool the detector when it is in operation. So the HPG detector has concentrations of impurity less than 10 power 10 atoms per cc. And depending upon whether you can take N type or P type, you can have the germanium detector based on them. If it is a P type germanium crystal, then you can prepare the N contact by lithium evaporation onto lab surface. Or if it is a P, if it is a P type, then you can make it. If it is an N type, you can make a P type contact. So you can make the P type contact by a surface barrier. Means you etch this with the with an acid, and then exposed to air, you get oxide layer. So that is how you can make N-type and P-type junctions on both sides of a intrinsic germanium detector. Of course, these uh, earlier times, you know, people did not have high purity germanium. So you have the you diffuse lithium. They call lithium drifted germanium detectors. But once you drift the lithium in germanium, it has to be always kept at liquid nitrogen. Otherwise, this lithium will keep on drifting at room temperature. So there were that was the drawback of germanium lithium germanium detectors. But now we do not need jelly detectors. We have the intrinsic germanium. Only when you want to operate them for gamma spectrometry, you need to keep it at liquid nitrogen to reduce the leakage current. Okay. So let us consider the discuss the properties of germanium detector. I was mentioning about the energy resolution. The energy resolution of germanium is one of the best resolutions. So they have excellent resolution in germanium detectors. Let us just typically do a calculation. If we have a 1 MeV gamma ray and the W value, that is the energy required to produce one electron volt pair. Then for 1 MeV gamma ray, you have 10 power 6 upon 3, 3 10 power 5 electron volt pairs. And if we assume that all of them are collected at the respective electrodes, then the resolution is 2 up 2 upon root n into 100 percent, that's a percentage. 
So, if you calculate this number, 2.35 is the FWHM for a Gaussian, 2.35 sigma, and so it becomes a 1 upon root n. So, in terms of percentage, so it becomes about 0.43 percent is the resolution. Compare this with sodium iodide thallium, it was about 6 to 7 percent. But this is the calculated resolution and the experimental values are of the order of 0.15. Typically, you know, at uh, 32 keV of 60 cobalt, we have the resolution FWHM equal to 2 keV. So, 2 upon 1332 into 100 equals to 0.15% or so. So, this is the kind of resolutions that we are getting with the germanium detector. So, this is even better than the what you expect based on the statistical fluctuation in the number of electron hole pairs. And that is why a concept of Fano factor has been introduced to, uh, to take care of the decreased resolution or rather the improved resolution compared to what we expect based on the Poisson's distribution. So, the Fano factor. Fano factor actually is the reduction in the resolution in the value of FWHM from the statistical value. So, that is 2.35 root F upon N when N is the number of ion pairs that are produced. And for semiconductors, the Fano factor is less than 1. You can see here 0.15 upon 0.3 that will be the kind of Fano factors that we will be getting. In fact, we did not talk about the different factors that are responsible for the improve resolution of the detector because inherently the detector was not having good resolution but in case of germanium resolution is so good that we will start taking care of the different factors that contributing to the FWHM of the gamma ray peak. So, we have the statistical fluctuation in the full width at half maximum because of the number of ion pairs or electron hole pairs that we collect that is the statistical factor plus the noise. So, when you have a few, few, few volt noise, few volt signal, then you will find the noise of few millivolts, 10, 20 or 30 millivolts will also start affecting the resolution. So, the FWHM due to the noise that will add up and the drift over a period of time, the system may drift the amplifiers, the multi-channel analyzers, different electronic circuits, you know, will have a small drift. So, the overall FWHM is actually a resultant of the statistical fluctuation in the FWHM, the noise and the drift in the electronic system. They all add. So, you, when you set up a German detector system, you need to reduce the noise, you need to see that there is no drift in the pulse sites and anyway, the statistical fluctuations are taken care because of the fan factor being less than 1, the resolution is anyway excellent. So, these are the kind of state-of-the-art data systems that people use for gamma spectroscopy. The fan factor in case of germanium is less than 1. There are other detector systems where fan factor can be more than 1. So, fan factor is nothing but observed variance upon the Poisson predicted variance f, f, f into n. So, if, if you expect n ion pairs, then the observed variance is less than n by a factor of f, where f is less than 1. So, excellent resolution for germanium detectors for gamma spectro gamma rays. Second part is the detection efficiency and the detection efficiency of a system depends upon the atomic number because the photofraction will be high if the atomic number is high. For sodium iodide thallium, iodine, I equal to, Z equal to 53, for lanthanum bromide, lanthanum z equal to 57 and so on. So, high z of a material will lead to high photofraction. For germanium, atomic number 32 and so the photofraction is less and therefore, we will find that inherently the detection efficiency for the photo peak is less than sodium iodide thallium or lanthanum might. Otherwise also in general, in, in, the, in the case of the gamma, gamma detection, the efficiency for detection decreases with the increasing energy because the photoelectric effect probability decreases with the increasing energy of the gamma. So, typical efficiency you can see here 1.5 minus 4, in, so in that range it can be minus 4, minus 3 and so on. 
So when you are doing the efficiency calibration for the gamma ray, you need to take the source of multiple gamma energy and calculate the efficiency by this formula. So here, when you do assay of activity, so you what you do in the peak area, you will see you will see a peak you will see a gamma spectrum like this. So you take the peak area, so divide by the time it counts per second, and you this counts per second, you divide by the efficiency of detection, the branching intensity of gamma ray to get the absolute activity. In other words, you want to get efficiency. Take a source of known activity, measure the counts per second, intensity of the gamma ray is known, branching it is so you can determine the efficiency. That is what is plotted here as a function of gamma ray. Now, as I mentioned already, detection efficiency of germanium detector is much less than sodium and thallium. Why? Because of the low atomic number of germanium crystals. And the efficiency decreases with the increasing energy of the gamma ray because the photoelectric absorption decreases with the increasing energy of the gamma. Now, let us see how a gamma spectrum is appearing in the case of gamma spectrometry with semiconductors. So, I will take that case two, the three cases. One is a large volume detector. So, I will take a case of a large volume detector and you can even take a well type. So, you can take this one. You take a well type germanium. It's like a sphere, and the gamma ray comes. It, it 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 interacts by a photoelectric effect, so it will give an electron, and the photon is absorbed. So this electron will deposit energy in detected material. Another gamma ray comes and undergo the Compton scattering, and then the detector is large in volume, so Compton scattered photon also may get further undergo photoelectric effect and deposit all energy. Similarly, you can have a gamma ray going for pair production. So, electron positron is produced, and this positron may annihilate with another electron to give to 511 keV gamma ray. So, all these 511 keV photons also may get absorbed because the volume of detector is large. So, because of this large volume detector, all three processes photoelectric effect, counter scattering, and pair production. So this is the gamma ray energy and this is the counts. You will find you will have the full energy deposition in the detector and so gamma ray spectrum will have a single peak. So for large volume detectors you get a single peak in the gamma spectrum but that is a little bit hypothetical case. It may not be possible to have a such a large volume detector. Let us discuss about the small detector. So you have a small detector whereby you have again the gamma ray undergoing photoelectric effect generating an electron and the photon is absorbed. So in this particular process will give to full energy deposition. Now you have the content scattering electron and the H nu dash and because the detector is very small in size the content photon may scatter. And similarly the pair production electron positron pair this may annihilate and give to 511 this 511 kV gamma rays may escape the detector volume because it is a small. So only the photon, the photoelectric effect, photoelectron that is depositing energy. So as a result of these processes, you will see counts, you will have a full energy deposition and you will have a Compton scattering. The Compton scattered photon are escaping, you get a Compton H. And since the 511 kV are escaping, so you will see here. Single for single escape and double escape of 11 keV escape. This is the scenario for a small tip. Now let us see for the intermediate volume that is the practical size detectors that we will be using. So you have a significantly bigger detector now compared to the small one. We have here the photoelectric effect, the photoelectron depositing energy in the detector volume. We have the Compton scattering. Elect electron is depositing and the photon is there. And this photon may further undergo photoelectric effect giving rise to electron and some part of H nu double dash may escape after second one more scatter. And the pair production of course 
it's possible that the electron positron pair is produced one part 511 may escape but other may not escape so the net result of these three processes you will see in now the intermediate volume detector in gamma so you have the photoelectric peak photoelectric absorption and now whatever was there earlier the photo the compound scattering there will be now multiple compound scattering so there will be now a valley will getting filled here and the, you may have a single escape peak of 1 pi so this is the typical gamma spectrum that you get with the practical detectors you have the full energy peak you have the compound edge we have the escape of one of the analysis in gamma day so these are the kind of features that you get with the germanium detector when you are doing gamma day spectroscopy just to compare the gamma ray spectra with the sodium iodide thallium for germanium detectors you can see here the blue one is for the sodium iodide thallium you can see two 511 two, two gamma rays of cobalt 60 1130 1172 and 1332 and this is the cgm 137 662 pv and over the same spectrum which is superimposed a gamma spectrum due to germanium detector you can see here 662 1172 and 1332 the resolution due to germanium is much much better compared to that of the sodium iodide and so this in whenever if you are doing gamma spectroscopy always go for germanium detectors of course germanium detectors are a little costly the typical cost of a germanium detector will be about 15 to 20 lakhs whereas a sodium iodide thallium will cost anywhere between 2 to 3 lakhs so one has to decide the kind of information that you want if you want uh, the high resolution you have to go for germanium detector systems now Detectors based on germanium are widely used for gamma ray spectroscopy. But in addition to that, there are detectors based on silicon, or there are also called lithium drifted silicon, that is called silly detectors. In fact, see, for if you want to do for X ray counting, you cannot use germanium because the germanium will have its own X ray and that X ray may escape from the germanium crystal. So, if you use a small germanium crystal for X ray counting, then you may have problem of germanium x-ray escape whereas in the case of silicon the x-ray is very small energy and so x-ray escape probabilities are much low so if you are doing x-ray counting go for lithium drifted silicon now why lithium drifted silicon because silicon alone you may not be able to have a big size silicon so you as you compensate for the p-type impurity by diffusing lithium and in silicon in fact, the lithium does not diffuse at room temperature. So once you diffuse lithium at high temperature, it remains in the silicon at its position. So for X-ray spectroscopy or X-ray fluorescence experiments, if you use X-ray counting, you use lithium detected silicon detectors. Advantages of these silicon detectors are many. They, have, they are less prominent X-ray escape compared to germanium. So the problem is not there. Then the greater transparency of silicon for high energy gamma so suppose there is a background of high energy radiations high energy gamma rays they will not impact the spectrum because most of the high energy gamma will pass through the silicon crystal then similarly less escape of electron from it at a surface in case of beta count you can afford use for beta counting also so the escape of electron from the surface is much less in the case of silicon and lastly the resolution of these detectors is about 150 electron volt for the 5.9 kV of iron 55. So you will find the silicon detectors based on the lithium drift silicons are ideal for X-ray counting. Then if you are to do alpha spectroscopy, for alpha counting you can use gas based counters but if you want to do alpha spectroscopy you use semiconductor detectors based on silicon. You can have surface barrier so you have a you have a detector of this type silicon very thin you can you don't need few maybe few, few millimeter thick silicon and you have this on the surface you have the gold coating you have a source here and you put the whole thing in a vacuum because alpha will get attenuated in the air so surface barrier silicon detectors where you use a p-type barrier layer on this silicon crystal to 
टू मेक ए पी टाइप जंक्शन और यू कैन इवन हैव आयन इम्प्लांटेड इफ यू टेक ए पी टाइप सिलिकन देन यू कैन हैव ए आयन इम्प्लांटेड फॉस्फोरस लेयर ऑन द सरफेस टू मेक ए एन पी जंक्शन सो दिस सिलिकन डिटेक्टर फॉर हाई फॉर अल्फा काउंटिंग यू डोट नीड ए जर्मेनियम डिटेक्टर यू कैन यूज थिंग सिलिकन क्रिस्टल बिकॉज देर रेंजेस आर वेरी स्मॉल सो इफ यू आर डूइंग चार्ज पार्टिकल स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी अल्फा काउंट अल्फा स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी यू आर काउंटिंग एक्टिनाइड्स फॉर देयर suppose you have mixture of plutonium and americium they have different alpha energy if you want to resolve them you use silicon based detectors and the typical resolution of this surface barrier silicon so ionium planted silicon is 15 kb at 5.486 kb of rather it is not kb it is mev 5.486 mev so 5000 kb and 15 kb you can see the kind of resolution that you get for alpha alpha spectra in silicon detector so you can for if you are counting mixtures of actinides plutonium americium for alpha counting you can simultaneously count alpha plutonium americium in a silicon detector and you can determine their activity so this is what is the i have not discussed much about but this the basic principle remain the same in the case of silicon based detectors for alpha counting silicon based lithium lithium drifted silicon for x ray counting and the germanium detectors for gamma so today if you are doing the spectroscopy or charge particles or gamma ray go for semiconductor detectors so i'll stop here thank you very much